thank everybody for coming. We're Dan and Mary Tillman, and we're with Caldwell Banker Burnett. And probably of you are thinking, what do realtors have to do with VA benefits? So, in just a nutshell, I'm going to tell you, because Neil gets the, gets the show today, because I know you want to hear from Neil. Dan and I are SRESs. We're seniors, real estate specialists. We only work with 55 plus. Um, and we know that sometimes people aren't planning on moving on or selling their house for 7, 10, 15 years. But before that, there's a lot of planning to do, okay? And that's what we do. We have a seniors program and we help you plan. Um, simple steps for the future you seek. So our signature program is do you have a plan? And we have about 15 different seminars that we do to help you plan for what is, what's ever next in this phase of life. And we're there with you too. We're both in our 60s as well. So we're heading towards retirement and we're right there with you. What we help you to do, which is today, is solutions for some of the problems. So some problems that we see as seniors real estate specialists is many times um, we have people that, um, maybe the husband's a vet, the, the wife certainly could be too. More times than not, we'll see the husband has Parkinson's or maybe dementia or something and is in a home or a health care someplace and the wife is still in the home. But she is paying out maybe ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000 a month in health care. Um, plus, she's taking care of the family home. And even if it's paid for, we all know there's expenses to that, right? And a lot of time as the money starts to dwindle, they come to us and say, what do we do? Obviously, as a realtor, we could say, sell your house. That'd be a great solution. But there's other solutions, too. And for VA, Neil and his team for Hennepin County here can provide some solutions. So maybe help you stay in age and at home. We're there to help with whatever the solution is, OK? Resources. We have tons of resources for you to get your results. So just so you know, what kind of led us to bringing Neil in today is we did a seminar here called How to Pay for Senior Housing. A lot of people get stuck because they think there's two reasons why they get stuck. One is decluttering. That's a whole other beast, OK? <laughs> we'll talk about that another day. Um, but one is because it's so expensive. My house is paid for. I can't live anywhere cheaper, right? So we talk a little bit about elderly waiver. We talk a little bit about using your equity in your home because to qualify for an elderly waiver, we're going to have to use up that equity and we want to use it in a smart way, okay? Um, affordable living is not Section 8. There's things like Dominion. If any of you have seen the Dominion, affordable housing is a rental, if you choose to rent, and it's below market rentals, and they're brand new and they're gorgeous, okay? We talk about that. We do talk about Section 8 and county assistance programs. Wait list on those are up to five years. That's why you need a plan, okay? It's not going to happen today. And we just talk a little bit about there may be VA options. We're not experts, so we send you to people like Neil. So with that being said, I'm going to introduce Neil Doyle. Uh, tell me your title over there. You're a senior. Um, I'm, I'm the director of the Hennepin County Veterans Service. Yeah, so he actually has a really cool team under him, too. So Neil, come on up and. and sure. All right. Well, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me today. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, so a little background about myself. I've been in veteran advocacy for about 15 years now. My uh, first career choice was a civilian police officer in northern Minnesota. Um, and then, and then uh, I had always wanted to join the military. So I joined the Army National Guard in 1999. Uh, went through Fort Benning, Georgia, became an infantryman. I didn't want to become an MP because I didn't want to get saturated with law enforcement. Um, my life quickly changed after the Twin Towers fell. In 2003, I was deployed to Kosovo for a year um, because 1st Infantry Division was invading Iraq. Uh, and then in 2005, I was deployed to I Operation Iraqi Freedom Iraq for two years. I spent 19 months in Iraq for the surge. Uh, we're extended in 07. Um, 
Between deployments, uh, I switched from law enforcement. I took a job at the federal building here in St. Paul and basically learned how to do VA appellant work. So I, I helped veterans disagree with federal decisions that the VA did um, when they got it wrong, because they don't always get it right. Um, when I returned from Iraq, I was recruited uh, to a position in Olmsted County where I became an assistant county veteran service officer. Um, when my boss left, I was appointed as the CVSO. And about three years ago, uh, I accepted the position of director up here in Hennepin County. Um, so that's just a quick snapshot on my background. What I'm gonna cover today for you folks is, is how the VA is structured. I find that if we take pause and explain how it is composed, it helps people out, because it is a very big bureaucracy. And then how the state uh, is covered, how, how they're composed. And then uh, what we do as county veteran service officers, because we're employed by the county. It's, it's a common thing where veterans are confused. What's the difference between federal and state and the county? Um, and I'm going to break all that down for you today. And then I'm going to summarize all the VA benefits available, the federal benefits and the state benefits that we, we assist veterans and dependents in applying for. And then uh, I'm going to open it up to questions at the end. So before I get started, how many uh, World War II era vets do we have in here today? Two. Thank you for your service. How many Korea War era veterans do we have? How many Vietnam era veterans do we have? Thank you for your service. How many peacetime era veterans do we have? Thank you for your service. And current conflict, am I the only one? Okay. All right, well, thank you for attending. So this is how the federal VA is composed. The VA employs over 377,000 employees, so almost half a million, and that's based on 2016 data. Most people, when they, when they think of VA, they think of the hospital system, the hospital network, and that is the biggest branch of the VA, and that's depicted over here on the right. That's actually the Minneapolis VA Medical Center. So that would be uh, your VA hospitals and clinics. Um, so the main ones that we work with here in Minnesota are Minneapolis VA Medical Center, and that's an inpatient, outpatient treatment environment, and St. Cloud, which is more long-term care and uh, chemical dependency treatment and inpatient care for mental health. And then there's the satellite offices, which we call CBOX, they're community-based outreach clinics. There's one in Shakopee here, there's one in Ramsey, Rochester, Mankato, um, there's a ton of them out there, Duluth, um, and that's more for rural-based health care. So, so veterans that live in outlying Minnesota have a place that they can do outpatient care at. Um, so the big ones that I'd like to highlight with the, with the Veterans Health Administration here in Minneapolis is it's a full-blown hospital, inpatient, outpatient. There's oncology, radiology, cardiology, dermatology, podiatry. They have all of these anything a normal hospital would have for the most part. Some of the specialty clinics is they have a women's health clinic now that's pretty robust. They can do mammograms and things like that there because our, our women's veteran population's increasing every year. Um, it's a little less hostile for females to serve in the military than it used to be, um, so it's attracting them more. Um, they, they also have a very robust uh, mental health program at Minneapolis. Uh, this is typically a topic that most people like to learn about, but they don't like to talk about it per se. Um, so post-traumatic stress disorder, either from combat or military sexual trauma is very, a very commonality in the military now. Um, and it has been for, for several decades since war was uh, embarked really. Um, but they have, several inpatient and outpatient options for veterans, depending on the severity of their symptoms. So um, if a veteran just has difficulty sleeping at night or, or they're irritable with their spouse, um, but they can maintain gainful employment and make it to work on time, they're fairly high functioning, but it's affecting their relationship with their spouse, an outpatient treatment option is probably the best, either psychiatry or prolonged exposure therapy where they talk about the trauma you know, with a specific provider for a few months. 
um, or cognitive processing therapy. Uh, often vets with combat experience have difficulty remembering certain aspects of the trauma. There's a lot of survivor guilt or self-blame. That program can assist with those types of symptoms. For veterans that are, that are having more of a employment handicapped, uh, they're more unreliable at work, they have difficulty making it to work, they're self-medicating with alcohol or, or street drugs in some aspects, and their relationship has maybe failed already, um, the providers may recommend more of an inpatient care environment for them. Um, for that, there's a, there's a unique program called PPH. It's Partial Psychiatric Hospitalization. And that's more for um, pre-retirement age veterans or below, where Monday through Friday it's inpatient, and then on the weekend they can go home and take care of bills, interact with family, and then report back the following Monday, and that's a three-week program. Um, and sometimes that's enough where where a veteran that's employed maybe has enough vacation hours to do that sort of thing. Um, and then they're more productive in the workplace and with their, their, uh, their social life after that treatment program. For veterans that are even more severe than that, uh, typically they recommend an inpatient care environment in St. Cloud. Um, often there's uh, chemical dependency that's intertwined with all these things. And uh, they try to obtain sobriety first and then tackle the underlying uh, mental health uh, symptoms after that, and that's really patient-centered uh, care. It, it, the length of the program depends on the veteran. Secondly, we have the National Cemetery Administration. Everybody uh, has been by Fort Snelling in this room, I assume. Um, there's beautiful cemeteries throughout our nation. Arlington is a, is a very famous one. They're pristine. They're held the, very, the highest standards of any cemetery in the country very I don't think I've ever fielded a complaint on uh, a national cemetery ever. They literally go out there with, there with levels each spring and level each marker um, after the frost gets out of the ground. Uh, they clean up the wreaths. They have a robust voluntary program for folks to help set out wreaths and then recover them uh, after they have died. I mean it's um, and I personally have two friends that are buried there from the Iraq war. Um, so I, I'm there uh, fairly often, and every time I'm there, it's very pristine. Um, and then lastly, there's the Veterans Benefits Administration, and they govern all the monetary benefits that VA provides. So, for example, the, and I'll get into them in my next slides, but disability compensation benefits if a veteran's hurt or wounded on active duty, pension, non-service connected pension benefits, life insurance, home loan guarantee, um, which uh, the realtors here uh, highlighted a little bit. Um, and then uh, some of the monetary burial benefits and then monetary survivor benefits for surviving spouses and dependents of veterans. So does everybody have a pretty clear understanding of how the federal VA is, is uh, structured before I move on? So this is how the state VA is structured. It's also called the Minnesota State Department of Veterans Affairs here. In some states, their military affairs is co-located with their military or their VA affairs. Um, but in Minnesota here, the Adjutant General actually, uh, Larry Shalito, discovered that budgets are really uh, competing in some years. So when you're trying to pay for beans and bullets, you know, for a National Guard unit, um, you can't balance that on the backs of veterans either. They're both equally important. Uh, but they belong separate from one another. So they're, they're structured very similarly to VA, but they're intended to fill gaps in programs, not, not uh, duplicate services. So the first area is their programs and services. This is very similar to the Veterans Benefits Administration that monitors or uh, that implements monetary benefits. And they, they have uh, some unique financial assistance benefits that we help veterans apply for that I'll get into in the coming slides. There's also state-run veterans homes. This would be the equivalent of the federal VA's health network. Um, and then there's state-run cemeteries throughout Minnesota. There's Little Falls, which is the big one up by Camp Ripley, Minnesota, if you've ever been, off, been by 371 there. It's right off the highway. There's Preston, Minnesota, which opened up a 
uh, about four years ago now in Bluff Country, Minnesota, in southeast Minnesota, south of Rochester, if, if you're familiar with that. It's a beautiful cemetery. Uh, one opened up in Duluth last Veterans Day. The first veteran was interned in that one. And there are there is plans and land allocated for uh, an additional cemetery out in Redwood County, Minnesota. Redwood has had very challenging times in getting a cemetery. They've always wanted a cemetery. A farmer actually donated hundreds of acres of land quite a few years ago, and they broke ground and found Indian burial grounds on it, which ceased operations. And they've allocated new land now that's been inspected, and it doesn't have Indian burial grounds. And now they're trying to secure the funding for that fourth veteran cemetery in the state. So there's a lot of unique planning that goes into a cemetery operation that I learned about when, when that stuff was happening, even with the one in Duluth. Duluth had additional land donated as well, but the bedrock was too high because there's a lot of granite up there and things like that. And lastly, us, we're at the county level. So we're county veteran service officers. We're, we're, all of us are employed by the individual counties. Uh, we're appointed and we're primarily, uh, our purpose and mission is to assist veterans and dependents in applying for federal and state VA uh, benefit entitlements. VA is, is, is very difficult to apply for benefits for on your own accord. Um, Without an advocate, uh, your chances of being denied service connection or pension are very high um, because there's, just to, just to apply for VA disability compensation for a unique claim such as PTSD, there's probably eight forms you need to fill out. Um, and, if, and not to say that the average veteran isn't intelligent, they are, but when you don't work with these forms day in and day out, they're very difficult to, to fill in. Um, and we do it day in and day out, so we can, we can finish this set of eight forms in front of you in about 20 minutes and then explain the process versus a veteran or, de or a spouse spending all night filling them out and still having all these questions in mind. What's the next step, you know? Um, so it really pays off to come in and just visit with us, have us fill out the forms for you. You just sign them. Uh, we'll explain the forms as you sign them and then explain the process that you're going to go through for each benefit entitlement individually. And sometimes veterans are eligible for multiple benefits, not just one at a time. We also have a website uh, that's located below on the screen, www.macvso.org, and that's a directory of every single CVSO in the state. Or if you just Google Minnesota Association of County Veteran Service Officers, it'll pop up. <laughs> Either way. Um, but we have over 120 members statewide. There's only 87 counties, of course, but some counties have multiple CVSOs, depending on the size of their veterans population. So here in Hennepin, we have approximately 53,000 veterans residing in Hennepin alone. And that's about a sixth of the state veterans population right here in Hennepin County. So we have about nine advocates in our shop. So I'll spend just a few minutes to explain where our office locations are. We have uh, six reps that are based out of downtown Minneapolis in our government center. Um, it's right by City Hall. The light rail runs right past it um, and other public trans bus routes. So it's really easy to get to that way if you don't want to pay for parking. We also have a full-time representative based out of Maple Grove in the community center up there. We have lease space. Uh, and we have a full-time rep in Richfield um, in, in a county building. Uh, it's above Houlihan's, if you know where that is, off, off Lindale. We have a full-time rep out there as well. We also serve a lot of veterans out at Ridgedale and Brookdale. Veep, and it's called in Bloomington, Minnesota. Um, and we also do home visits on a case-by-case -case basis if a veteran's aging in place or they have a transportation barrier, they just cannot make it uh, to any of our facilities, we'll, we'll go to their residence. So this is a summary of federal VA benefits. Um, and each of these benefits has different eligibility criteria, um, different forms for applying. Um, so I'm gonna give you a real high level uh, description of each of them. 
because if I get too detailed, you may walk away thinking you're not eligible for them when in fact you are. Um, so I'm not gonna get too into the weeds unless there's very specific questions. Probably the biggest and most important benef benefit that is life-changing that we work with is disability compensation. So this is if a veteran's hurt or injured on active duty, wounded in action for our Purple Heart recipients. Uh, and there's a slew of presumptive disabilities ba based on unique experience. So um, there's actually like five different ways to become service connected, and a lot of vets aren't aware of any of them. The first one's direct service connection. So a good example would be uh, a paratrooper in the 82nd Airborne uh, does a jump uh, above Normandy drop zone, which is in Fort Bragg, by the way. And um, it's a night jump, low altitude, uh, drops his rucksack and um, doesn't hear it hit the ground, he doesn't break in time, and he blows out his right knee. That, that right knee is a direct injury in service, so that would be direct service connection. The next one's aggravation of a pre-existing injury. So let's say that same paratrooper went through MEPS and he was in high school football and had a minor knee injury uh, that was documented in when he entered the military. Uh, but because uh, of the bad landing he had in Fort Bragg, it completely tore up the knee. That aggravated his knee to the point of past natural progression of, of the high school injury. So it worsened it substantially. The next one is secondary. So this would be, take the same case, uh, that knee injury, over time the veteran discharges and he favors his left knee for several years um, because his right knee is very weak. Um, maybe his meniscus is torn up. Um, after a while, uh, his left knee go, gets shot because he favors it. That knee can be service connected secondary to the right. The next one is very rare, but I have gotten a couple of them through and it's called 1151 or a tort claim against the VA hospital. Um, you can file one or the other, a tort claim or an 1151. 1151 essentially service connects an injury caused by a physician at the hospital based on malpractice. It's very rare because there's several elements of malpractice that a veteran needs to meet. Um, but the one that I got granted was a cardiologist advanced a catheter too far into a veteran's heart and tore one of his valves. Um, the doctor knew he screwed up at the time, uh, retracted the catheter, documented it in a, in a service member's chart immediately, um, and they service connected that right away. So, um, some other cases I've had, um, a veteran had open heart surgery and got a scap infection, that one, and, it, and they actually had to remove part of his sternum. That was denied because the veteran didn't adhere to the post-discharge uh, instructions of the physician. He didn't take into account self-cleaning, things like that. And those can be a little more difficult to get granted. I don't think any hospital system is perfect. Um, I think the, the health care that veterans get at our Minneapolis VA is, is pretty good. Nationally, when you look at the whole picture, it's very good. Um, you got to look at how the VA is staffed, too. Um, so there's something called snowbirding everybody's aware of. Who, who winters down south? Anybody in the room? Or did you winter down south at some point? Nobody? It's very common, though. Um, what happens to the veterans, the hospital administration when that happens is um, they, Phoenix, uh, Florida, they deal with an influx of patients in the winter and then, um, you know, less in the summer, but that influx causes them to be understaffed all winter. What happens up here in Minnesota is we're adequately staffed all year round, but in the, then in the winter it's even easier to get in up here. The waiting lists actually go down. Um, so that we're kind of at the opposite end of the curve up here, fortunately for us. Um, but that's how the VA is staffed. Um, another way to get service connected, and it's very, very rare, is there's a special education program for our returning soldiers that are injured on the battlefield called vocational rehabilitation. You don't necessarily have to be wounded on the battlefield, I shouldn't have worded it that way any injury on active duty. So let's say, let's say a service member is a mechanic 
or a construction worker before they go on active orders. They deploy, they get injured, they, they blew their lower back out. And their back is so bad now they can't even return to being a laborer when they come home. The VA will pay for up to a bachelor's degree to retrain them into a field that kind of caters to their disability. Um, if they get hurt or injured in the course of that training, that injury would be service related. It's very odd. Um, I have not run into one of those yet. The last one and most common one is presumptive. So I'm gonna cover those thoroughly in the coming slides. Um, education and training, I just kind of dipped into that. Your GI Bill programs, Montgomery GI Bill, Post 9-11 GI Bill, vocational rehabilitation. Um, they implement that. Uh, there's employment uh, assistance. A lot of that's through the state that we rely on. Um, life insurance programs, so there's quite a few different uh, options there. So there's service group life insurance when a veteran's actually on active duty. They can elect up to 400,000 while they're on active duty. So if they pass away, um, they'll sp their spouse or whoever they assign as a beneficiary will be awarded that. There's also traumatic group life insurance, which a lot of us selected before we deployed to Iraq or Afghanistan. And that's if you, if you lose a limb or multiple limbs overseas, they'll, they'll pay you even if you live. They'll pay the service member <coughs> traumatic uh, injury ins insurance. And uh, it's about 80,000 a limb, I believe, or, or it was. Very rare claims, but uh, they, they have occurred. Um, once a veteran separates, there's a grace period where they can elect to, to have veterans group life insurance, and, but then they pay premiums. Um, and then that's up to $400,000 as well. The most common one that we work with is actually uh, service disabled life insurance. So um, you gotta remember when looking at insurance programs, when you're older in life, um, VA might not be the best deal, but where it is the best deal is a lot of, uh, is with presumptive disabilities. So if you look at Agent Orange specifically, heart conditions are attributed to Agent Orange. Diabetes type two is attributed to Agent Orange. Parkinson's disease, ALS of all service. The veteran or the VA has to look at the veteran with a clean bill of health and disregard any service related conditions. And if they're healthy, aside from service related conditions, they got to insure them. Um, so the veteran can elect uh, uh, $1,000 increments up to 10,000, it's kind of a burial plan. Um, and then if they're 100% permanently and totally disabled, the VA waives the premiums on the first 10,000 and the veteran can elect an additional 10,000 is the way that program works. And there's different options again, you know, there's ordinary life, there's endowment at 60, endowment at 65. Um, we can walk through those options with you if, if you're interested in them. Um, home loans, VA home loans, so, so any veteran that successfully completed their, their uh, service obligations eligible for a, for a home loan. If you're Guard and Reserve, if you did 20 years and retired, you're eligible, or if you're called to a deployment, you're eligible and completed that. About the best, uh, about the best thing, the best thing about a VA home loan would be that um, they waive uh, mortgage insurance. You don't have to pay mortgage insurance under a VA home loan. Um, and that for younger couples is, is a good selling point because they can actually get into a better house or, or uh, keep their bills down lower during their first mortgage. Um, and that helps a lot. Also, if you're service connected, they waive the VA funding fee, which is a percentile of the closing costs. And then healthcare, which I touched on earlier. <coughs> burial benefits. Um, the big burial benefits that we work with is uh, there's forms that we can fill out to help veterans pre-register for a plot at state cemeteries if you want to pre-register. So it's kind of in order uh, at the time of death. It's less burden on the surviving spouse. Um, there's a way that you can lay the groundwork now for national cemeteries. You can send a DD-214 into the National Scheduling Office, 
so they have it on record. So in the event of the death, all the family member really has to do is schedule the burial. You can't pick a certain plot though. Like I like, I like this spot of grass under this tree. They they don't allow that. But anything else, you know, they'll they'll let you pre-register for. Um, what's included in a federal or state cemetery is a lot, uh, and I learned this when my father-in-law passed away. Um, they they will they supply the headstone, the grave marker, opening and closing of the grave. Uh, the um, the vault, the concrete vault, which is about ten grand, I heard in a private cemetery, so that's considerable cost right there saved. For a spouse, there's only a one-time fee of seven hundred and fifty dollars. Um, the VA is also very good at transferring remains. So, um, if a veteran's interned at a private cemetery and chooses to be uh, transferred to a federal cemetery. They, know, they, they have it ironed out, they can transfer the remains pretty easily. And they can do it between uh, um, federal cemeteries as well, and state cemeteries. Um, so for example, there's a lot of veterans interned in Little Falls. Little Falls was the only state cemetery for years in the state. One opens up in Prescott or Duluth and it's closer to the family, they can pay a one-time fee and have the, the body uh, transferred. So it's easier for visitation. <laughs> Um, for private cemeteries, um, what's included is the government marker um, and a burial flag, of course. And um, uh, let's see, if it's a service related death, um, the veteran will receive up, the surviving spouse will receive up to $2,000 in a burial reimbursement. If it's a non-service related death and the veteran was in receipt of any type of monetary benefit from VA, uh, it's tiered, but generally around $750 is what the family will receive after death. So the, the question was, uh, does VA assist with cre uh, cremation at all? So uh, where it's confusing is VA just does a flat reimbursement of cost. So the, the question was, if you're in cases of cremation, um, what options are there for a ground burial or a columbarium burial, which the columbarium is a vault, for those of you that don't know. So in a state or federal cemetery, it, it is up to the veterans or surviving spouse's wishes. So just because you're cremated doesn't mean you have to go into a vault. You can go into a ground, into a ground, um, um, a ground burial if you choose, if that's your wishes. Um, because there's a lot of, there's also a lot of mixed uh, wishes too. Sometimes spouses want a casket burial. Some, sometimes their spouse wants cremation. Um, but they can put, they can put, literally they can put two cremations in the ground. They can put a casket in an in a urn in the ground um, and vice versa. It doesn't matter who passes away first either, by the way. Um, if the spouse goes first, uh, they're interned first and then the veterans placed on top of them. The, the question is, is can you get memorialized um, basically at a, at a state or federal cemetery um, where if your ashes are scattered, yes, you can, you can be memorialized with a marker. Um, th there's also more tragic cases of that where the remains weren't recovered. Uh, and that's in every war, believe it or not. Even today, there's certain remains that aren't recovered from the battlefield, so those veterans are memorialized there. Every day you see in the paper where POW or MIA is returned from Vietnam or Korea or World War II, because our forensics are a lot better now, and the local population, we're at peace with them, so they're, they're giving a lot more information to our country on the whereabouts of those, those uh, fallen. Um, very tragic, but it's it's it, it is very uh, common, um, you know, a common place right now. Dependents and survivor benefits. Uh, the the biggest one we work with is called DIC, and that's dependents indemnity compensation. So if a veteran passes away from a service related condition, whether or not the VA is actually service connected or not, by the way. Um, so let's say it's a Vietnam vet that didn't even know about VA benefits and they pass away due to ischemic heart disease and it's on the death certificate, the surviving spouse can come in 
and we can get her service connected for cause of death. Um, and that's a tax-free benefit of up to um, about $2,000. It starts at about $1,700 and then there's special monthly benefits for veterans and spouses if they require aid and attendance or their housebound or, or things like that. Um, by the way, disability compensation payments are tax-free and they range from about 137 a month all the way past 4,000 a month if you're, if you're uh, looking at amputeeism, loss of use um, of extremities, things like that. Um, the second survivor benefit that is very popular is widow's pension. Um, similar criteria as veterans pension, but uh, did I, I don't think I covered veter or, uh, veterans pension very well. <coughs> So there's a benefit out there if a veteran is over the age of 65 and low income or 100% permanently and totally disabled not due to the military and they're low income, um, the VA will basically pays them a monthly stipend to keep them at the poverty rate, um, you know, so they're, so they're not uh, destitute. Go ahead. What is low income considered? It's uh, different based on household size. Um, so like a maximum annual pension rate for a veteran, I believe, that uh, does not require even attendance is around 23,000 with an asset limit of around 80. Don't quote me on that. I don't have the regs in front of me. Um, but uh, basically it's the same definition of HUD, you know, that low income standard. And then it goes higher per dependent that you have. And also, if the veteran is housebound and then requires regular aid and attendance with activities of daily living, I don't know if people are familiar with that, but feeding, bathing, grooming themselves, um, those types of things. There's a physician's report that we provide to the veteran or family member that's assisting the veteran in making application, then a physician fills that out. Um, basically, we report everything when we help a veteran apply for it. And then the Pension Maintenance Center in St. Paul makes the determination on the monthly amount. But it's reduced dollar for dollar. So let's say, example, your only source of income is Social Security. They take the manu maximum annual pension rate, which is that poverty line. They subtract the amount you're receiving in pension divided by 12. <coughs> That's going to be your monthly pension rate. But you can also uh, deduct out-of-pocket medical expenses that you pay, so like insurance premiums or, or co-payments on drugs, dental, braces, anything orthopedic, um, and then that's subtracted from your income, so you get a little bit more each month, if that makes sense. So presumptives, this is probably my favorite topic. There's probably a veteran in this room even that doesn't know about it. A lot of vets hear about it through word of mouth or they pop into one of these. Um, there's literally a veteran a week or two veterans a week that come into our county building that didn't know about this, that has a diagnosis on record already and the unique service to back it up. So basically what presumptive means is the burden of proof is no longer on the veteran's back if they're diagnosed with very specific conditions and you know they have the unique service to back it up. So the, this unique service includes you know, what I mentioned before, if they're a former prisoner of war, I was fortunate enough to do a few of these when I worked in the St. Paul VA regional office. Um, they're very few and far between. World War II was the highest generation of POWs that we worked with. Um, there, was a, there was a very good federal counterpart of mine that worked in the federal building at the time where he made it his goal to make all POWs 100% service connected um, before they passed away and I, I believe they succeeded um, because a lot of POWs did develop a, a majority of these presumptive conditions. Uh, Asian orange exposure, and that's expanding every year. It's expanding in two ways. It's, it's expanding by what's on the list of presumptives, the disabilities, and it, it's expanding as far as the government releasing additional locations where they've used it. It's not just, age, it's not just exposure in Vietnam. It's presumed in Vietnam, so in country, and blue water vets, they've expanded that too, and it's like 12 nautical miles uh, from the borders of Vietnam, 
and nautical it has to do with the curve of the earth i'm not a navy vet i'm an army infantryman but um, it basically skirts the coastline um, so they're adding ships to that registry as we speak it's very new legislation um, but they didn't just use it in Vietnam, they used it in Okinawa. That's where, uh, you know, the military's jungle warfare course was. They've used it in South America, they've used it in Elgin Air Force Base, they've used it along the DMZ in, Viet in, the DMZ in Korea uh, during the Vietnam War. Um, does anybody in this room know what Agent Orange is? Anybody want to take a stab? Defoliant. Yes, correct. It, he said defoliant. So. It was a herbicide used to kill vegetation so we, should, we could see the enemy easier around bases. They also used it to kill vegetation uh, for other operations that they needed to. You know, maybe they needed to, an engineer unit needed to put a road in so they'd clear the vegetation out first then put a road in. Um, it, it's a chemical, that's what it is. DuPont had a lawsuit in the 80s uh, and part of that lawsuit settlement was they the VA had to agree to do studies through the Institute of Medicine <coughs> linking certain disabilities to Asian orange exposure. And the list I'll share, share with you in the next slide has grown from just a few to now there's about 20 on there. The problem with presumptives is when, you're, when you just get out of the military when you're 18, 19, 23 years old, you're pretty healthy. You don't, you don't have all these ailments right away, but as you age, you're diagnosed with these. Um, and that's where, you know, they basically start doing patient studies. There's enough pool of a patient study to, they do kind of a triangulation, I, triangulation from what I've learned. But uh, the way they did Agent Orange was banana farmers used it in South America, service members that were exposed to it, and then the local population in Vietnam. So they triangulated the three of them, and oh, these are, this is the pattern that's emerged of all that. ALS is a unique one where it's amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, it's Lou, Lou Gehrig's disease. Uh, it's terminal, typically within five years tops. But they, they have done enough studies to determine that any veteran of any area, era, or regardless of where he or she served, if you're diagnosed with ALS, they relate it to the military because approximately 60 or 70 percent of those diagnosed with ALS had military background, which is odd. Yeah, but um, that one still baffles me. Atomic radiation, uh, this would be uh, occupation of Japan, Nagasaki, Hiroshima, the A-bombs that we dropped there. Uh, it wasn't, wasn't just uh, Japan, um, but it was also the Bikini Atoll, the Marshall Islands. They did uh, radiation testing down there. They dropped, uh, they dropped uh, atomic bombs there, and service members were sent in to, to, to the ground zero to see what had happened and things like that. Gulf War, these are undiagnosed conditions, so um, I'll share them with you, but it's service in the Middle East. Uh, Camp Lejeune, exposure to toxic drinking water. This was largely caused by jet fuel or contaminants from jet engines that, went, that soaked into the groundwater in Camp Lejeune. And they caused a lot of uh, digestive cancer uh, type ailments, and I'll share with them with you on the next slide. Veterans involved with Project Shad, any history buffs in here that might know what Project Shad is. Um, not our proudest moment in history, but the Navy actually sprayed a fog in the Pacific Ocean, sailed vessels through it, brought all the men on deck um, to see what it did to them. So they, they tested chemicals on some of our, our seamen. Um, and that was shortly after World War II that that occurred. I've only ran into two cases of this. Both of them were service connected. Um, so when you run into them, if they have the paperwork bonifying the exposure, the vessel that they served on, the VA doesn't question it, they grant it. So this is all the presumptive disabilities, and it's very hard for you to read, my apologies. For the sake of time, 
are there any former POWs in the room, or do you have any family members currently living that are POWs or surviving spouses? Most of them are squared away in the state, and I know that because I worked in the federal <coughs> building. So Agent Orange, um, the big ones that we need to watch for are Hodgkin's disease, multiple myeloma, any respiratory cancers, any of them, um, the long bronchus larynx trachea, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, prostate cancer, um, peripheral neuropathy, uh, type 2 diabetes, chronic lymphatic leukemia, ischemic heart disease, Parkinson's disease, and hairy cell and B cell leukemia. This list is not all inclusive though. What I tell people is if you're a Vietnam vet and you're diagnosed with, with something odd that you can hardly pronounce, you need to stop in and see us because although th these are on the list, there are some physicians out there uh, that can study your family history, they can study your service, and they can articulate um, a rationale if they believe that Agent Orange could have caused this condition. Um, um, a lot, some of them are trained in them. I, I used to work in Rochester and I worked with male uh, physicians quite a bit on some of these. And there's doctors out there with very unique backgrounds that are able to, to do it on a case-by-case -case basis too. Um, your atomic radiation, I'll, I'll give you the high level, it's cancers. Um, almost any type of cancer that you can think of. but. Um, it's all forms of leukemia, cancers of the thyroid, breast, pharynx, esophagus, stomach, small intestine, uh, your pancreas, bile ducts, gallbladder, salivatory gland, urinary tract, kidneys, your brain, bone, lung, colon, ovarian, pretty much any type of cancer um, if you're exposed to radiation. Um, Gulf War illnesses, the big one is chronic fatigue syndrome, so you're always tired. Um, fibromyalgia, that's pain basically throughout the body um, in most all the joints. Irritable bowel syndrome, um, that's a combination of constipation and diarrhea. Symptoms worsen over time. Uh, that's because of the diet that a lot of service members are on in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and then any other diagnosed, undo, uh, um, diagnosed or undiagnosed illness that the Secretary of VA's warrants presumptives for. Um, they're opening up a lot to female veterans that have menstrual conditions after they return, their cycle's completely out of whack. Um, a lot of those get service connected. And then Camp Lejeune, uh, due to the toxic drinking water, uh, again, these are cancers, um, kidney, liver, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, adult leukemia, multiple myeloma, <coughs> Parkinson's disease, um, and then bladder cancer. Bladder cancer is also uh, presumptive of radiation exposure. Um, so I'll, I'll go back and piggyback on Agent Orange again. Um, a majority of men are diagnosed with prostate cancer at the end of their life, towards the end of their life. If you served in Vietnam, in your case, it'll be presumed due to Agent Orange exposure. The majority of men pass away from a heart attack. Um, so just high level, keep it in mind, spouses, veterans, if you pass away from a heart, or if you have a heart attack, or you're diagnosed, or you need stint placement, or anything like that, that's presumed due to the military. Uh, if it's ischemic, and most of the time it is ischemic. Um, the other big one was uh, diabetes type 2. Um, a lot of veterans are diagnosed with diabetes towards the end of their life. In your case, if you served in Vietnam or within 12 nautical miles of Vietnam, it's going to be service related. But these are very common conditions that all men are diagnosed with in that period of your life. So. That's why a lot of these are overlooked. They, they just think, it, you know, the doctors tell them it's normal for your age, which is true, it is, but also you got to keep in mind because of that herbicide exposure, um, you're, you could be drawing compensation for that. Even if the veteran himself is, or herself is very stubborn and they don't want to file, you got to think of your spouse's livelihood after your passing. If you get it service connected, 
that surviving spouse is going to have more income. Um, a lot of people don't want to talk about death, but when you pass away, that leaves a, a vacuum of lower income in the household. With this, if it's service connected, at least your spouse has that to fall back on. It's going to help him or her with some of the burial expenses, um, and they're going to thank you for it, you know, at that period of time. So.